stand up tonight. Let's worship the Lord with our voices. Let's just sing out a song of praise. Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord.
Church, we're going to pray tonight. Help me pray for Andrew, Elena, Brittany, Jordan, Erica, and Ben. All of these for salvation. I want you to also please pray for these that need healing. Uh, lifting up Dave tonight. He's got some uh, severe head pain. He's uh, out tonight. Uh, I want to lift up uh, little Ari, Lazariah. Evans, uh, many of you know, uh, he went uh, went in to the, the doctors there. He's been see, they kept him over at uh, Radies for a couple of days. Uh, there's a breathing issue going on. The report from William tonight is they're checking him out. He seems to be just fine. Uh, he wasn't just fine before he was going in, but they're saying he's just fine now. So I say let's keep praying for him. Uh, he should be discharged tomorrow. Should be able to walk right out of there. <laughs> please pray that God's hand would be upon him uh, asking you to pray as well please uh, for Pastor Ray Pickering uh, his cousin was shot this morning and killed uh, he lives in Chicago he and his family live in Chicago uh, he was taking his 7 year old daughter to school this morning and was shot dead on the street. So if you would please remember Pastor Ray Pickering's family. Pastor Ray, uh, pastors up in the, the Vista area, he's out at the Chandler Church, uh, his family there, extended family in Chicago. Please help pray for them. Continuing to pray as well for Victor Tagle. Many of you heard there was a good report. Doctors say uh, looks like his kidneys are now functioning properly. Does not need a kidney transplant. Uh, no more dialysis, they're saying. Uh, thank God for that. Continue to pray uh, for his liver as well. They believe his liver does need to uh, swapped out. Uh, so let's pray. Continue to believe God for Victor Tago. Victor Osuna as well. Please pray over him. Uh, Karen Hill, God bless her and give her strength as she recovers. Uh, praying that God's hand and touch be upon her. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, that are not with us tonight for various reasons, uh, that God would help them where they are at. We want to pray that God's hand be on our daughter churches, God helping them, our leadership churches, God bless them tremendously. Be in prayer as well for the areas of need, for youth, uh, praying for Navy, praying for families to come into the kingdom of God. We've seen a number of visitors uh, uh, recently. Let's pray that God would help them to return and serve. Him. How many of you, you need God tonight? If God sees your hand, pray please for our missionaries that are overseas. Uh, be praying for them. Again, praying for the Smith family. Uh, Pastor MacArthur Smith down there in uh, Worcester has just lost his mother the other day. His father just went into the hospital. He's had no appetite since his wife has passed. Uh, he's been unable to eat uh, for a number of days now. If you would please lift up uh, MacArthur Sr., before God. We're going to pray together for our service tonight. Uh, and then as our prayers come to an end, Stephen, would you ask God's blessing on us tonight? Let's pray together, church. Oh, Father, God, have your Father you God. see these needs we bring before you. We are a needy people, but we know that we serve the God that answers prayer. And Lord, we take dominion and authority over sickness. Pray over Dave. Pray over God, over Victor. Lord, believe you to move in our being. Pray, oh God, for Pastor Ray, for his family there in Chicago, help them to Smith so God, your miracle working in the New Testament. Yeah, God, thank you for this uh, service, God. Lord, all that you're doing this place, God, all that you're doing in our lives, God. Lord, I lift up uh, these on the prayer list, God. I uh, Lord, for salvation, that you would continue to move on their hearts, God. Draw them to repentance, God. I pray for breakthrough in their lives in Jesus' name, Lord. God, I lift up, uh, Lord, those on the prayer list for healing, God. Lord, lifting up uh, Victor Tago, Lord. Uh, Victor Asuna, God. I uh, Lord, praying, God, against uh, sickness and disease, God. I pray, uh, Lord, for uh, continued miracles, God. I uh, continue to reports, Lord, of you moving in their lives, God. Lord, praying for complete healing and restoration of their bodies, Lord. Uh, God, I pray, Lord, for this, uh, uh, pastor and his uh, family, oh God, I uh, Lord, that you would move, God, I uh, Lord, during this time, God, Lord, that you pour out comfort and grace, God, I uh, Lord, help them, Lord, uh, to be able to experience, Lord, your peace, God, your hope through the situation, God, Lord, that you would have your hand of covering on them, Lord, uh, God, I pray, Lord, for, Lord, uh, Pastor uh, Smith, Lord, and his uh, family, God, uh, Lord, that you would help them uh, uh, through this uh, time, God, uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, give them uh, peace, 
God, Lord, a strength, God, Lord, to be able to move forward, God, Lord, and continue to see your hand work in their lives, God. Lord, I pray that you, uh, God, move upon all of our missionaries, God, bless them, Lord, uh, during this season, give them, uh, Lord, a supernatural revival and a breakthrough, God. Uh, Lord, we're praying, Lord, God, for your, uh, Lord, a harvest field to be planted, God, uh, Lord, that we'd see uh, people saved, God. Lord, even move in our church, God, uh, Lord, continue, God, to fulfill your promise of fruitfulness, Lord, help us, God, to reach out to the lost, God, Lord, to see people, uh, God, uh, Lord, coming to you, God, uh, Lord, to see your lives are transformed and changed, Lord. Thank you for all that you will do tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you take your seat, please turn and greet those that are around you tonight. So glad to be with you in church tonight. Good things happening in the house of God. Just a couple of announcements for you, church. Uh, this Saturday, there will be morning outreach. Uh, regular time, regular place here. Uh, then later in the afternoon, Claremont has asked us to send our bands over to them to help them. Uh, they, I believe they are starting at 5 o'clock uh, their location so we've got our bands that are going over you can help uh, to support that if you have questions about it see William he'll be heading that up uh, for this Saturday Sunday we'll have our regular services uh, 9 30 Sunday school 10 30 the morning service 6 30 the evening service then Monday is Labor Day Monday is the Labor Day baptism and picnic and we've already got them lining up. We've got some people lining up for water baptism. If you've been saved but you've not been water baptized, uh, please see me. We'll help you out this uh, Monday uh, there uh, at Tidelands Park on Coronado Island. If you want to uh, get in on the carne asada, pollo asada, and all the rest of the goodies, uh, uh, please see William. You can hand him some cash. He will be purchasing that this Sunday afternoon. And yes, that white boy knows where to go. So it's okay. Don't fear. Don't fear. We're under the guidance. Is that right, Junior? We're under guidance? Okay. So it's still going to be good. It's still going to be good. That's uh, just got to have good friends, right? Just have good friends. Uh, but please bring your stuff as well. Do what you do so, so very well. Uh, bring out your dishes. Uh, yeah, anything you want to throw on the grill, you can bring that uh, but all, uh, as always, bring any and everything you can uh, uh, because we have a tremendously good time. Then uh, Tuesday following that, uh, we will be having a uh, baby shower for Talia that uh, Tuesday evening. Uh, if 
if you have any questions, Adrian or Marilyn, either one of them can help you with that. And that's all at the moment for our announcements. Ushers, would you come help serve God's people tonight, please? Give them an opportunity to give into the kingdom of God. You know, many times uh, we get ourselves uh, uh, into, uh, uh, into a, a point of view that is not always true. It's very easy, especially when it is a negative uh, point of view. There have been studies that are, that are done uh, by wage earners, and they've been asked, do you feel that you are... Uh, uh, that you are earning enough for the job that you are doing. You feel that your, your wages are, are uh, commensurate with the job. And it is interesting to note uh, that in some companies, uh, you will find that most of the employees will tell you, no, no, I'm not, I don't get enough, uh, uh, I'm not uh, uh, being paid enough, uh, but you can go to a competitor's company. They're doing equal jobs, but it's a more successful company. They're landing more contracts. Their product is being sold more, but their employees are being paid exactly the same wage. You will find that when you ask those employees, they will tell you, yes, I am getting a, a good pay for the job that I am doing. And it's interesting to note, uh, same t similar jobs, uh, similar fields, uh, uh, but those that are, are okay with, they're, they're even excited about what they're getting paid and what they've got coming in for their job, their companies uh, are more successful. And it has to do with their outlook. It has to do with their whole mindset. Uh, here I am coming to the job, I'm getting a fair wage, and I'm going to work as hard as I can, as opposed to the others who say, I'm not getting enough, I'll drag my feet until they recognize me. And their lack of productivity continues to keep the company at a point where they can't be paid more. But I so thank God for God's people. If you were to ask God's people in this place, do you think it's worth giving into the kingdom of God? Without question, we would have, without hesitation, the, the majority of everyone in this place would immediately respond yes and yes again. Absolutely. I absolutely am thrilled at that opportunity. And with that heart and with that attitude, we have been able to see Great things that God has done through this church. We've been able to see tremendous uh, things that God has been able to do. Three churches out, getting ready to put a uh, missionary on the field, uh, being able to uh, support, being able to, to, uh, to reach out into our community in large ways. Uh, and we're believing God for even greater things. Amen. I encourage you, be faithful, return God his tithe that belongs to him. Give uh, toward world evangelism, give towards your pledge. Uh, mark that on your, your envelope if you got your check. If you're giving online, you can do that at sbpottershouse.com. Just use the appropriate category. Heads are bowed. Uh, junior, if you would ask God's blessing on the gift and all who give. Well, we thank you, Father God, for the blessings that you have given us, my God, for your faithfulness to your word and your promise, my God. We ask, God, that you would bless this gift, my God, that you would use it to continue, my God, to, to reach outside these four walls, my God, to see people saved, Father God, to launch churches into the harvest, God. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. No power on earth is mine.
so much these on the platform. As they're finding their seats, please turn with me. Thank you. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. in their family, and uh, Mark is now uh, a, uh, an analyst on ESPN, and uh, there was an interview with him where he was asked questions like, uh, what is it that would hold you back, uh, what, what obstacles were impossible to uh, overcome, uh, what challenges uh, uh, have stopped any of your dreams becoming reality? And uh, have you ever felt limited by people in your life? Questions along these lines. And, and as this interviewer was, was going over these questions, suddenly Mark uh, Schler just stopped for a minute and said, let me, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you something that happened some years ago. Back, uh, it was a Friday night, uh, and uh, it was uh, T-ball. My son Daniel was five years old at the time, and eventually he made it into the big leagues, but there he was playing first base for T-ball. The batter approached, and wearing the helmet, so big, if you've ever seen Little League uh, baseball, uh, Looks like a bunch of little mushrooms out there playing. And so this little mushroom comes up to the plate uh, and swings with all his might, uh, manages to smack the ball in a dr line drive right down the first baseline. Five-year-old Daniel very coolly lifted his glove, caught the ball, and then stepped on first base. Oh, by the way, the bases were loaded. So he catches this ball, and then he coolly steps on first base, getting the first base runner out as well. Double play. As they're driving home, Mark recalled, uh, he said, I glanced in the rear view mirror. There's my little five-year-old held in the firm embrace of the seven-point uh, uh, car seat there and uh, and as he's looking at his son he can see that his son's mind is he's just working on something has something profound and finally he says that was a great game son that double play was really something dad he replied next game I think I'll turn a triple play Mark says, immediately I turned into the preemptive strike managed disappointment mode. I told him turning a triple play was virtually impossible, almost never happens in baseball. There are men who've played their entire lives never seeing one and gave him a whole dissertation why triple play isn't in the cards besides this is Little League, this is T-ball of all things, uh, and tried to tried to help set his son up uh, uh, for what was definitely going to be coming disappointment. His son's reply after probably ten minutes of his dad talking to him, his son's reply was, "Yeah, thanks, Dad, but I think I'll turn one anyway." 
Next game, we'll arrive. It's a beautiful day. Virginia spring morning. Got to a point, bases are loaded again. This time, Daniel had been moved to third base. And uh, little mushroom batter steps up to bat. And this time, this kid takes a mighty swing and hits the ball a line drive down the third baseline. Once again, Daniel coolly puts his glove up, snap right into his glove, and then steps on third base. He then proceeds to pull the ball out and zing it to the second baseman who just happens to be standing on second base. Seeing this ball coming at him, the second baseman panics, closes his eyes, and shields his face with the glove. And the ball lands right in it. <laughs> Snap! He instinctively shuts his glove on the ball, and there's a moment, that second of silence that feels like, a, like half a week, that second of silence where everybody in takes breath and suddenly everyone is screaming, triple play, triple play, triple play. Hats are thrown in the air. They had the enthusiasm of high school graduates, uh, celebratory hugs, high fives, uh, and he said, I learned from that. I learned that we shouldn't place somebody in a box. We shouldn't be so concerned and consumed with trying to convince people what they cannot do. He even made reference to Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of many, but encouraging one another, and all the more as that day draws near. I want to encourage you tonight. I'm using a baseball illustration. We have been paying attention. The Padres are in the middle of the pack right now. Season's not yet all over. There's still an opportunity for the Giants and the Dodgers to fail. Uh, there's no hope for the Diamondbacks, unfortunately. Um, but I've been following as the Padres have done last season. They had no one in the stands. They actually did very, very well. Uh, this season, it's people back in the stands. They've not done quite as well, but there is still potential there. And we could sit back and completely pick apart uh, the team, pick apart the whole organization. Uh, but uh, instead of trying to pick things apart, maybe we can see God help some, with some encouragement. If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is, again, I believe, showing his heart as he writes, uh, drop down to verse 11. He's talking about... Uh, uh, his conduct and his attitude towards people and how the church, their attitude should be as well. And in verse 11, we pick it up as he says, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you should walk Worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. Let's think for a second about Christianity. Oftentimes, we believe that we just got to keep our head down, keep our nose to the gospel grindstone. As Christians, we've just got to keep our heads down and keep pushing forward. And there is a lot of truth to that. 
We do need to just keep pressing forward. But there are times that, that pride comes into play. Many times pride comes into play. Pride can be a very, very slippery thing, can it? And there's times that, that we will even condemn ourselves uh, thinking, if I enjoy my Christian life too much, then I'm too prideful. And I'll get some kind of a heavenly smackdown. God will use me as the ball in the t-ball game. Many times, I know we think that we are all that. But there's also other times when our pride swings us in the other direction. And we consider ourselves very low on the Christian totem pole, if you will. We, if you've seen the totems that the... Inuit have carved their faces of their various uh, uh, spirits or gods, if you will. Uh, uh, we would we think that our face is always on the bottom, right? If we were to put faces in order, ours would have to be down at the bottom. This is the same attitude, I believe, that Zacchaeus had in Luke chapter 19, where it says that Jesus, as he enters Jericho, he's passing through, and there's by a man named Zacchaeus, uh, who's chief tax collector and wealthy. He, he wanted to see Jesus, uh, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now, his physical stature was short, uh, but there are oftentimes we have short view of our own Christian life. Anyone ever feel like you can't see God? I can't see Jesus in this situation. I can't see God. I'm, I'm keeping my nose to that Christian grindstone. I'm giving it everything I got, to, but I can't see Jesus. We're spiritually too short. And sometimes we think, I guess I was just, like Zacchaeus was born that way, I guess I was born again this way. But not only do we have to keep our head down, but we also know that we have to keep our face up. Right? Got to keep a good Christian face on every day. Good Christian people we are, right? <laughs> Everybody out there, our nice clothes, our nice hair, our nice brush teeth and everything. Here we are. Here we are on Wednesday night. Church, look at us. We're looking good. And we know that we don't come in wearing our feelings on our sleeves, if you will on our sleeves or on our face. Uh, you know, we have a hard day coming on Wednesday night. We need to just come in. So everybody asks me how my day was. <laughs> how my day was. Please ask me how my day was. I really want to bum everybody out right now. But you know what? Not us. By God, we are Potter's House people. <laughs> we can't show any sign of weakness. Uh, and, and oftentimes we put a ton of energy into crafting our exterior. And then we spend the rest of our energy worrying about how other people view that exterior. And we can be confident that we are in the game. You're born again, right? You're a Christian. Amen. Amen. And we can be confident, yes, I'm in the game, I'm on the team roster, but I'm just triple A. I'm just minor leagues. I'm, I'm a minor league player. I'm in the farm league, right? San Diego Padres, they have farm teams. They have guys that, uh, that they don't pull up into the major leagues. These guys play uh, for, for next to nothing. They, they, it's, it's a very, very hard life. Uh, uh, playing in the minors. Uh, they have the San Antonio Missions. There's up the road, there's the Lake Elsinore Storm. Uh, also in Texas, the Fort Wayne Ten Cups. My, my favorite, I think I mentioned them before, my favorite is the El Paso Chihuahuas. <laughs> That's a farm team for the, for the San Diego Padres, the El Paso Chihuahuas. When I was preaching for uh, Pastor Nick and Jennifer there in Chicago, uh, he actually knows the history of the El Paso Chihuahuas. He's 
interesting conversation. Anyway, back to my notes here. Um, <laughs> preaching can stir our hearts, can inspire us. We can, we can come up from an altar after a service uh, believing that I'm going to climb higher. Uh, and that uh, many times is my goal. That's m my, my, my objective, my end uh, point that I want to see is as people get up from an altar that they believe that they're not just some minor league player. Listen, you are called up in the major league. This is major league stuff that we're playing here. The devil is playing for keeps. He is a thief. He's a destroyer. He's a murderer. Has been from the beginning. Wants to kill, steal, destroy. Wants to tear things down. And we are not a powerless people. We are not just minor people. Oh, we'll just call you up when there's no one else to call. Uh, you know, tried to call this guy, tried to call this one, tried to call no one. So I guess I'll call you. Maybe you can help me pray. No, you're in the majors. That should encourage you. You have been called, equipped, and you're not playing some little minor league Christian game for some, some lesser prize. Think with me about words for a moment. Good preaching presents words that, that stir our hearts. That's what Paul is reminding the churches in, in Thessalonica. He's reminding them here, saying, you know how we exhorted you. That's the same as in Romans 12. One, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, right? That I beseech you. That is how we exhorted you. We encouraged you greatly. I exhort you. It literally means I call you beside me. That's what it literally means in the Greek. The phrase does. I called you to come and stand beside me. I called you to be with me in the same place. Imagine, here is the Apostle Paul, right? And he is saying to every one of them, everyone that feels like they've been a new convert for the last 14 years, every single one of them that feels like, man, serving God for the first five was great, but now, man, things are really hard. Every one of them, Paul says, I exhort you. He's saying, look, you can come. You can stand right with me. You are worthy to stand right with me. God is not going to push you off. He's not going to kick you down to some lesser team, uh, but you stand uh, right with me. I have confidence that when I ask, for example, when I ask you, please pray for a family, pray for the Smiths, pray for the Pickerings family. When I ask you to pray for the, the Buckles of the church, and when I ask you to pray to help the Carls and their paperwork go through, I trust that I am speaking though to those uh, that are like-minded that stand with me and that your prayers are just as effective as mine. He says, I exhorted you. Remember, then he says from there, not only did we exhort you, it says we comforted you. Comforted you. That literally means to encourage. In the Greek, it, the word comforted there means someone who comes up and reminds you, listen, it may be bad, but it's not as bad as it seems. It may feel dark, but it's not as dark as it seems. You can open your eyes. You can trust God. You can walk in the light as he is in the light. God will bring light into that dark situation. You hang on. It may be very difficult right now, but God's going to help you through it. Yeah, amen. Encouragement. When you encourage someone else, 
The Greek idea of encouragement, this is fascinating. The Greek idea of it was, hey, I know you've got your perspective, but can you maybe see things the way I see things? I know you're discouraged. I know you're having a hard time. I know you're going through it, and it's difficult for you to see ahead. But I'm looking ahead, and I see Jesus. Can you just borrow my eyes for a moment? Just, 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 I know your perspective. I know it's tough, but could you maybe look at it this way a little bit? That's the encouragement. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That one mind literally means a comforted mind. It comes from the same word, from a mind where you're seeing things the way that I am seeing them. Then, he says in our text, not only did we exhort and comfort, but we charged every one of you like a father does to his children. Part of a father's job is to see the right behavior in his children and encourage it. Dads, if you're, any of you are wondering here, what's my job? What do I do with these little things? Can't even remember their names half the time. What, what, do, I, what do I do with it? You know what you do? You find anything that they're doing good, anything that is right, and you applaud that. You encourage that. You fan those flames. You focus uh, on that uh, and help them uh, to see and to understand what is uh, right uh, and good behavior. As pastor of the church, you could almost you could almost say I feel at times like a father figure. There will be times when, for example, I was just talking to my pastor the other day. Pastor asked me about, hey, how are things going in the church? So what do you think I say to him? What do you think my response to him is? Oh, pastor. <laughs> Got an hour. <laughs> Let me just start telling you about something. He said, no, you know what? When he asked me, how are you doing? How's the church going? How, how, are those, how are things going? My chest swelled a little bit. It's like when you ask a, a father about his children. A father who's involved and loves his kids. You ask a father about his children. He's like, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, like, let, me, let me tell you about my kids. Let, let me tell you what how well they're doing. You think I tell him evil things, bad things, hopeless things? Are you kidding? I brag about you like you're all my kids. <laughs> I saw him praying with people. I saw him encouraging people. You would not believe how liberally they give. They are continuing to press through hardships and challenges. Yeah, there's been some plenty of challenges that have come our way, especially here in California. There, there have been plenty of stuff that's headed down our pipe. But you know what? We're pushing it through. We're making it happen. We're seeing visitors. We're seeing souls saved. Uh, God's doing great things. Amen. And the reason I tell you that is not to at all pat myself upon my back whatsoever, but to hopefully encourage you a little bit. You know, it's fascinating when Balaam was trying to curse God's people. Balaam, hired by this wicked king Balak, I want you to speak curse over God's people. So Balaam, he's going to do that. Many of you know the story. But as he does that, God, God has a few things to say. It's a strange thing. God looks down at his people and he says to Balaam, I don't see any sin in them. There's nothing there to curse. I don't see any. Let me look at my people. Nope. Hey, Balaam, 
I don't see anything wrong with them. So instead, you're going to speak blessing over them. You're going to prophesy a good future over them. Now, when I read that, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, God. What about that whole Mara bitter thing? What about that whole we don't have enough meat thing? What about that whole, anybody remember the whole golden calf incident, any of that? What do you mean, God, you don't see any sin in them? Well, when God is dealing directly with his people, he'll say, you need to deal with your sin. But when you've got someone that wants to harm God's people, wants to hurt them, that wants to try to curse them, wants to try to do any damage to them, God looks and says, I don't see any problem with them. You got a problem with them? You got a problem with me. <laughs> You're not going to speak curse over them. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn your words completely around and you're going to bless them. You. You can rise up. You can rise up and do great things for God. Because you are called up into the majors. I know for some of you that doesn't mean anything. Either way, you don't make it. What does that mean? It's a good thing, trust me. <laughs> you have been called up. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Can we say amen at that? <laughs> he says not many of you were wise. Sometimes I take the M off of that and just say not any of you were wise <laughs> according to worldly standards. Ain't none of us were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth except yours truly descendant of the Queen of England. But... <laughs> Oh, Grandma, I'll see you in heaven someday. <laughs> but God chose what is foolish in the world uh -huh, to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So if you feel a, a little less wise, if you feel weak at times, uh, that's not a cause for shame. That's not a cause for I can't do this. Uh, this is just too hard to serve God. Instead, it should begin to inspire you to say, you know what, God? Uh, yeah, here I am. Just do what you can with me, Lord. <laughs> and God will do great things. Amen. God will do great things. First Peter, how many times did Peter, uh, Peter, Peter, uh, the phrase I've mentioned before, my dad has a number of pet phrases, one of them was, son, sometimes you only open your mouth to change feet. <laughs> That's how fe Peter felt many times. Peter, I'm sure he felt just like, as I'm about to say the next thing, uh, let me push my right foot out so that I can put my left foot in. Later on, it's Peter that writes back to us and says, listen, you need to understand this. You are a chosen generation. You're a priesthood, but listen, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You are a people who are his own possession. And you can proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I don't know about you, but sometimes that just blows my mind that God called us into his light. I was talking with Rick and Kathy Buckles when they were first pioneering what is now the Claremont Church here in San Diego, when they were very first pioneering, uh, they had gotten this tiny little building, uh, and they're operating between that building and their home. Uh, and there was one lady that was coming, Kathy, she said, yeah, Pastor Rick would make her shake all the bugs out of her hair before she came into that house. Uh. Please shake all the fleas out of your hair before she came Just shake them off into the cars before you came into the house. In the house. <laughs> and 
sometimes, God, you're inviting me in with my fleas. You're inviting me in with my, you know, my clothes are dirty, my shoes. You know what I've been walking through? God. Yeah, you know what? God has called us into his marvelous light. God has called us in to where things now can be seen clearly. Third section of point two. So it's point two, B, three. I just had to write down. You're not a chihuahua. You've been called to bark with the big dogs. So I want you to I want you to be encouraged tonight. I want you to go for it. I just want you to go for it. God's drawn on you. God's pulling on you. God's putting people in your path to witness to. God's stirring you. Go for it. Jump out. Step out in faith. Believe God. What does he say? Walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Verse 12 out of our text. Walk in a manner worthy of God. He told the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 4, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Walk in a manner worthy of God. That word, walk, has been, it's used in two, two different connotations. One of those means that we, that we walk around to view something. Walk in a manner worthy of God means to, to walk around and to, to take a moment and study something. Look at it from all the angles. You and I walk in a manner worthy of God. Take a moment. God, let me, let me see what you're doing here. God, let me see what you've got for me. Let me see here the things that you've got ahead. Uh, the second thing that it is used for uh, is that uh, you would walk uh, in an upright manner. There's all kinds of ways we walk, isn't there? Like earlier, like I said, you come in with the attitude, shuffling in, dragging your feet in. And we can walk a little bit upright. When I was in marching band, uh, we had a band teacher in high school who was very serious about marching band. We did all of these competitions, actually became quite good uh, at uh, all of the various formations, if you've ever seen m marching bands or drum and bugle corps on a, on a field as they uh, do various forms and shapes. And you're carrying an instrument, you're playing, while you're walking around on an uneven grass field. If you're going to successfully do that, uh, you have to have some good posture. You have to be able to, to be up. If you're hunkered in, if you're leaning over, if you're lazy about it, uh, then you're going to step into a hole. You're going to hit a divot, uh, a little tuft of grass that's thicker than in another area. is going to trip you up. Uh, the weight of some of the instruments are going to start to weigh on you. So we would go through these exercises uh, of how to get ourselves standing straight uh, and, and then practice from there. And it made us tighter. It made us uh, uh, it made us prouder of what we were doing. So you and I, we therefore, should walk in a manner that is worthy of our God. We can walk with our heads up, uh, knowing that Jesus Christ has paid the price for us, uh, and I am going to live my life. Like Jesus paid for it. Amen. I'm going to live my life like it was worthy to be paid for by God. Go for it. Jump out in faith. Be that witness. Be that one who is going to press in and believe God for more. 
Keith Collier writes about his 10-year-old son, Will. He said, me and my son love baseball. There's another baseball analogy for you because you're such fans of it tonight. <laughs> he says, Will, my son, loves to be a part of the team. And with most, ki most kids his age, his skills have progressed at 10 years old. This past spring, Will went from coach pitch to kid pitch, which brought both excitement and anxiety as well. It's not the coach pitching to these little boys now. Now it's uh, the kids are throwing, they're pitching to the batters themselves. And he says, it only took a few games before I could see the anxiety overshadowed the excitement. Will hit the ball well during practices and pregame warm-ups, but, warm but whenever he stepped in the batter's box during the game, uh, he began to freeze up in fear, uh, so much so that he would not even move when an errant pitch would come right at him. He was so, so afraid, so fearful, so sucked up uh, that he couldn't even move, even when the ball came right at him in his very first game, he was hit in the arm by a pitch. That painful experience, his father said, only made him more fearful of batting. So dads, as dads do, they're going to just joke about it, right? So dad joked about it after the game. Ah, I know it hurt, buddy, but at least you didn't get hit in the face. He said the very next kid, or the very next game, pitcher threw one and hit him right in the face. He struck out several times because he was afraid to swing the bat. And this intensified his anxiety and his timidity. Whenever his turn at bat approached, it got to a point where he would complain of feeling nauseous. So finally, Dad says, I asked him, Will, what goes through your mind when you're up to bat? He admitted, Dad, I'm afraid I'm going to strike out or I'm going to get hit by the ball. He was so afraid of the pain, so afraid of the failure and embarrassment that he didn't even want to try. And so Dad said, let me put it simply to you, son. If you never swing the bat, you never hit the ball. If you never swing the bat, son, you never hit the ball. And so what I want you to do, starting next game, is every time you get up there, I don't care where the ball is, you swing at every pitch. I don't care if he throws it so far outside, the catcher has to leap for it. You swing that bat. Just swing it. And over the course of that season, Will began to swing his bat more and more, struck out uh, on a number of occasions, uh, but there was that one moment uh, when the crack of that bat hit the ball uh, and he got a base hit. You know, maybe, maybe you've been bruised, maybe you've taken one on the chin, You've planned, you've got a great idea. I'm going to witness to these. I'm going to do this ministry. I'm going to just grab some flyers and just go out. And, and, and you've got a great plan. It's Mike Tyson that says everybody has a great plan until they get punched in the face. Maybe you got punched in the face. You're up to bat. And you're not so sure about swinging. I want to encourage you to swing. Swing. Witness to that person. The job, the place you're headed with, just be vocal. Pray for them. Believe God. Is God stirring your heart? Somebody write another play. Maybe increase your offering at times. Maybe learn an instrument. Maybe just grab a couple of people. Hey, let's just go do a let's just go do an outreach in the city. Let's just grab a couple of people and go over to Walmart. Hey, let's make sure. Let's let's follow up on 
on the new people that we've seen. Those that have been down at the altar, some that have been coming. Let's not let a day or two go by before we have we have contacted them and set up some way that we can get together with them. I know God's stirring. I know God's challenging. I know God's encouraging and drawing. And so tonight, my whole focus is just to simply tell you, don't wait. Jump out. Swim. Believe God. And we're going to see God do some great things. I want you to bow your heads with me, please. Oh, God, we love you in this place tonight. Just, just go for it. Oh, God, move on our hearts. Get out of here. Perhaps there's some people here tonight that you're not right with God. Maybe, maybe you know about God. Most people in America do. Maybe you know about God. You might even say you love Jesus, but... You've never genuinely given your life to And tonight you feel the power of God's Spirit pulling upon you, drawing you, that you would surrender to Him, that you'd give Him your life, not just your words, not just some mechanical actions, but you would give Him your life. There's others perhaps, maybe you did serve God for a while, but for whatever reason, you turned your heart back to sin. You know you're in sin. You know you're not right with God. Please don't, don't continue to hold on to that. Come clean before God. He will forgive you. Let him heal you. Let him bring restoration. If that's you that I'm talking to tonight, you know you're not right with God for whatever reason, then let me help you pray. Just slip up a hand. Pastor, here's my hand. I, I know I'm not right with Jesus. I need to pray. I need to get my heart right. I've been in sin, and I don't want to stay that way. I need forgiveness. Lift up a hand. I will help you pray tonight. God will hear your prayer. Jesus will forgive your sins. I'm going to ask one more time. We'll move on to other things. If that's you tonight, lift up a hand. Pastor, here's my hand. I know I'm not right with God. I'll help you pray. Father, in Jesus, we thank you. Then let me turn this to you, Christian. God's drawing on you, God's pulling on you. And maybe, maybe the focus has just been on the difficulties and the challenges and the irritations, the annoyances. And tonight you just want to simply say, you know what, God, I want to, I want to focus instead on the good things that you can do. Maybe instead of looking at all the things that I can't do or we can't do or that person shouldn't do or can't do. Instead of, instead of thinking along those terms, God, help me to think along the lines of what we can do. That, that I can that I can step out in faith. I know you're pulling on me, Lord. I can pray for my brothers, my sisters around me. I can pray for them and see you work through them as well. God, you have called us out of darkness to stand with you in your marvelous light. Oh, God, help us to see. Help us to see with your eyes. Help us to see with another perspective. God wants to help you. God wants to encourage you. God wants to make you fruitful. God wants to bless you. I open this front as an altar, and I invite you to come out of your seat. Some of you, you need to come down here tonight and say, you know what, God? I need to look at this through different eyes. I have been looking at my life, my relationship with you. I've been looking at these situations, and my eyes have not seen hope. My eyes have not seen goodness. My eyes have not seen the way forward. So, Lord, let me have your eyes. Let me have a different perspective. Let me see some things the way Jesus would see them. Let me look at things in a little different. God, help me to see things better. God will help you. I, you feel right now, I know you feel his ministering presence. His spirit is on you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you sweep over your people. Lord, let them have encouragement. 
Let them have hope. I know, Lord, that as they're struggling or wrestling through right now, even the areas where, where the argument comes, that I know, but I have stepped out. I have tried to reach out. I have reached people. This has happened or this other thing has happened. I don't feel as if I can. I don't think I'm qualified. I've tried. It's just not happening right now. I take dominion and authority over every unclean lying spirit right now. And I cast you down in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, let your spirit overwhelmingly let each one of your people feel the value and the worth that you have placed upon them. And Lord, you have called us into your light so that we can be effective, so that we can be fruitful, so that we can have a, a deeper, a better relationship with you, so that we can see not a dark, dim, or even hazy future, but because we are in your light, we can see uh, the brightness of what you have ahead through every difficulty, through every trial and tribulation, Lord. Uh, Help us, God, to realize that you have called us to operate to powerfully, to do great and mighty exploits for your name. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Shut up, I go to go and say, God, I'm not going to tell you you're a liar. You will not put God's people into a box. You will not put boundaries around them. You will not continue to tell them what they cannot do, what they're unable to accomplish. You are a liar, and we judge you tonight in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Praise and honor and glory to your name. You take the time you need to pray. Talk to God. Work through a couple of issues at the altar. If you're not praying, help me sing. Unforgiven because you were forsaken and unaccepted. Joy. 
Father God, thank you for this message this evening, Lord God. I'm asking it to resonate within our hearts, Lord God. God, I'm asking your spirit to fall upon each and every one of us. God, help us through the rest of this week, Lord God, that we would go for it, Lord God, and be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you tonight. Amen. 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 Amen.